about parasites this evening um, and I'm going to discuss about the different parasites that we see in our horse population and also donkeys. I'm going to discover what the different types of parasites there are and um, what their life cycle is and then how they might cause us problems and the diseases we might see um, in our patients. So we can broadly split parasites into two different sections. Um, the first is called endoparasites and that basically means they affect the horse on the inside. Um, and the ones that we see the most of are ones called roundworms, and they're also called nematodes, um, tapeworms, which are also called cestodes, trematodes, which are kind of flatworms, and then we also um, might see bots inside as well, which are actually a type of insect. Ectoparasites are ones that affect our horses and on the outside, uh, and these can be split into insects and arachnida. So I'm going to go through each one of these and discuss about the different ones that we see. Just thought I'd better mention a, a bit of terminology, so I will use uh, abbreviations in my talk. Um, so larvae, these are kind of the immature or young form of the parasite, and the larvae can undergo different stages of development to become the adult, and there can be a numerous um, larvae in the horse, um, ranging from L1s up to L5s, and that's just the different stages, so just different, different numbers of that. Um, I also use PPP and that's the pre-patent period and that's the time between the animal becoming infected with the parasite and then them having adults um, in them that may then shed the eggs and then can transmit the disease to other horses um, or into the environment. Um, it's a bit like the incubation period, we're all becoming very aware of, of how long we've been um, for different diseases, how long we might be harboring them before we, we start shedding them and that's a, a similar thing. So the first topic tip area I'm going to talk about is um, the endoparasites and the main one is, is the roundworms. They're called roundworms because they're round, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and these are pretty simple worms and they have a simple mouth and they eat by basically using their mouth to attach to things and then ingesting. There's huge amounts that can affect um, horses and donkeys and lots of different ones that I'm gonna try and cover. They all have a very similar life cycle and that's it that they have adult worms that um, pass that lay eggs and these get passed into the feces uh, and then puff out, popped out into the environment. They ha the eggs then hatch into larvae and the lar larvae then either develop in the feces itself or potentially in another host um, such as an insect or another um, mammal or bird. Um, and then often it's the L3 stage. So we've gone through the L1 and L2, so the different early stages, and it's this L3 stage that then infects our, our horses, um, but they have five stages. So they go through numerous um, life cycle stages. So probably the one that we all worry about the most and one that definitely causes us the most problems is the cyphostomes. And these are the small strong gyles with the small red worms. And hopefully the picture here you can see, and uh, we've got those little worms there and those are their classic, classic findings. The PPP, so the pre patent period, um, can actually has quite varied times. And I'm gonna talk about that a bit more because it's really important, but it can be as little as six weeks. So they can go from in being infected by the, the small red worms to shedding the eggs within six weeks, or that stage can actually take up to two years. So horses can be harboring um, this infective type of worm for a long period. The re really important one with these ones is that the L3, so the, the larvae stage three, can insist, and that's what we call um, basically become quiet live in the large intestinal wall and, and they then go on to develop L4s which is the next stage and when these L4 larvae emerge they can huge huge amount of damage to the intestinal wall and we call this kind of mass emergence or you might have heard of it as larval styathosnomus which is a disease that causes um, particular problems for horses it has a really high mortality rate. So around 50% of horses who um, develop larval stathostomus, so this emergence of all these larvae all at the same time from the large intestinal wall, um, about 50% of them may die. It generally affects younger animals because they don't have the immune system system you know, immunity against these um, small red worms. And they're often, it's often characterized by horses that have rapid weight loss. Um, they develop edema, and this is usually a kind of a swelling that's seen under the belly, which is where fluid is kind of pooling. Often they get diarrhea, show colic signs, and can actually rapidly um, go downhill and actually die. Um, this horse here is a horse that is in the hospital, unfortunately suffering from larva stathostomes 
can see he's a bit on the skinny side of life and unfortunately not looking so great. We treat these animals with intensive care. Um, so these animals obviously have lots of IV fluids, they have um, drugs to try and combat the um, diarrhea. And we often obviously need to get rid of the, la the larvae that are there and worm them as well, but it can be quite a complicated case. We're lucky and Emily's gonna talk about that in that we can now detect the antibodies to these larvae um, where we never used to have a test for them. So it was very difficult to know if a horse might be um, harboring the, these problematic larvae. Moving on from the small red worms, we've got the large red worms. So the large strong owls, and there's three different types. They've got quite long names, as you'll see mentioned here. Um, Strongulus vulgaris, Strongulus aldentitus, and Strongulus equinus. Um, and these tend to infect different parts of the body and they do migrating. Um, and they're actually not so common anymore, um, but they can cause us some problems. So these ones, they actually migrate through blood vessels. So through the large arteries, um, the liver or the pancreas, depending on the type of the, the one that might be infected. And then they go into the large intestine and cause nodules, which you can see um, in the picture here or on the right. And when the nodules rupture, they release the adults um, and then they shed the eggs on from there. These ones are actually blood feeders, um, so they can make the horse a bit anemic, um, having a low red blood cell count. And actually the problem with them is often the migration um, through the other organs and especially through the arteries. Um, and if the arteries become blocked by these worms, it can cause um, part of the intestine to, to die, um, which can cause quite marked colic signs. We're pretty lucky in these days in that actually modern parasite control has really reduced the prevalence of these parasites and actually we don't touch wood see many problems with them anymore um, but there's something that, that is was very important and could be important if we um, have problems in the future the ppp for these guys is between six to eleven months so um not not too short um kind of mid-range pinworm is something that i'm sure plenty of people um, would probably come across and um, these are white worms they're about 10 centimeters long um, and they've got a kind of characteristic appearance to the tail, which you can probably hopefully see in the picture here on the right. The larvae of these um, worms invade the intestinal wall, um, but they don't, actually don't really cause many issues for the intestine. But what does happen is that the adults come out and they lay their eggs around the anus. And you can actually sometimes see the eggs and the white dots. And that causes horses to have a bit of irritation and they might be rubbing their tail um, and causing themselves some trauma. To detect these, we often see something called a sellotape test, where we can pop a bit of sellotape and try and pick up the eggs and then look under the microscope. And what you're seeing there on the lower picture is what we see under the microscope. So this is the eggs of, of pinworms there. So they've got quite characteristic shape. Um, and the life cycle and stages for these ones um, is about five months. So Ascarids, these are um, really white worms again, but these ones are much longer. They're usually about 40 centimetres long. Um, as you can see from the pretty dramatic pictures that you can see on your right, um, these can cause quite high burdens. And really we're looking at these in younger animals. So um, it should be less than 18 months old. Um, horses uh, mainly affected by these. After that, we tend to see immunity being developed and they don't cause problems. Saying that with the resistance developing in our in our patients, we have started to see these causing problems in older horses. And I did see a clinical case in a horse that was actually um, about nine years old. And um, so it could be something that does become a problem for older horses. Um, the larvae for this type penetrate the small intestine and then they migrate uh, through the liver into the lungs and then they come up the trachea and um, so the horse actually coughs up the larvae and then swallows them again and sometimes this can be seen in the young stock as having you know developing a cough or being a bit kind of ill thrift so a bit skinny um, and if they do have a big burden, um, these types of worms can cause quite a big intestinal blockage. Unfortunately, the, the youngster on whom these pictures here had a very significant blockage. Um, and despite um, our best efforts, unfortunately, um, had a rupture of its intestine due to these worms. So this is something that we do worry about in youngsters. And we are seeing more resistant to wormers um, for the ascarids. The eggs for these is the little picture on the bottom right. Um, and they're kind of thick walled. Um, and we'll talk about how we might detect those a bit later in Emily's talk. Um, but those can be important ones too. Then we've got some that we don't see too much, um, but they're there. So hair worms are very small and very fine, as you can imagine, look a bit like a hair. 
These ones don't have any, the larvae don't migrate, so they just stay in the same location. And in kind of rare cases, they can cause weight loss, um, ill thrift and diarrhea. Habronema, also called the stomach worm, it's kind of a slightly bigger worm, about 2.5 centimeters long. And these ones actually, the stable fly is really important in their life cycle. So they're one of those intermediate hosts that I was describing. Um, and the stable fly actually deposit the larvae um, around the mouth and eyes, and then the horse swallows them um, and they then develop in the stomach. What we can often see where the larvae have been deposited is the summer sores, which is what we're seeing in this horse's muzzle here. And um, if it's developed around the eyes, we can also see conjunctivitis. So that's something that um, does intermittently cause um, some problems and we might pick up if you're seeing lesions like this. Um, and sometimes you can actually see the, the little larvae in the, in the eye, which is a, is a bit gross, I'm gonna be honest. Moving on, we've got a few other ones. Um, so Strongyloides westeri um, is an intestinal threadworm. Again, they're very slender um, and these mainly affect foals and they actually um, ingest the larvae via the mare's milk. Um, so when they're nursing, they are ingesting the larvae that are in, in the mare. They get sw um, um, They also have a migratory period through the lungs um, and then move back into the small intestine. And again, can cause kind of ill thrift and weight loss and anorexia in, in foals as well. So it's something that we do um, treat for. Then we have the, the neck threadworm, pretty not that common in, in our country, but it is possible. Um, lace can be quite long. Um, and the midge, the horrible midge, um, I don't know if there's any positives to midges. Um, they are the intermediate host for this type of worm. Um, and they can get, you get skin um, lesions and can obviously cause um, irritation. Not something that we see particularly commonly, but um, it's possible. And then here's a lovely donkey. Um, so donkeys um, are particularly affected by um, something called um, lungworm. And actually the donkeys themselves don't have any disease, but they do harbor um, the lungworm. And we see, mainly see problems if our donkeys are pastured with our horses. And actually the horses are much more affected by the lungworm than the donkeys are. And as you can imagine, these actually obviously, again, migrate through the lungs um, and again, cause coughing um, and can actually cause a pneumonia. So it's something that if you if we um, have a see a case of, of lungs problems and we know that the horse is um, stabled with or has um, access with donkeys, it's something that we can we can look into. Moving on, so we're moving on to the tapeworm. So this is a different type of worm. So um, these guys look a bit different. I'm gonna show you in the next um, slide. They have a segmented body and they have four suckers on their head. And these um, type of worms actually break off part of their body um, when they're full of eggs and then the eggs are shed in that part of their body. Importantly, um, the eggs of the tapeworm are ingested by forage mites um, and the larvae develop in the forage mites and then the mites are eaten by our horses. Um, the larvae then develop at the ileocecal junction, and that's a junction in the, in the intestine between the small intestine and the large intestine. And it's kind of an important junction because it, it's kind of narrowing um, where food moves through. And what can happen um, is that, the, as you can see in this picture here, this is the tapeworm attached to the junction. Um, and if you have a lot of tapeworm, they can actually cause kind of an obstruction there. So they're about four to five centimeters long. Um, for most horses, they don't cause them problems in low burdens and you might just see a bit of ill thrift if it's affecting them. However, in some cases we do see colic and that can be from the kind of mild spasmodic right up to the fact where this, this junction becomes completely blocked and we actually get a rupture, um, which is something that is, is obviously unfortunately fatal. We know this is the egg of a tapeworm. However, it's very difficult to detect eggs for tapeworms in the, in the feces. Um, so fetal egg counts are not useful um, for these types of worms. Moving on, so trematodes, which is the fourth different type of worm that we might see. Um, and one that we see in, mainly see actually in other species. So mainly affects sheep and cattle is something called fasciola hepatica, also known as fluke. Um, and these ones have quite a, an interesting life cycle involving uh, water snails. Um, but the main thing that they cause problems for is the migration um, of the fluke through the liver. Um, and they can live in the liver for quite a few months and they actually become adults in the bile duct of the liver um, and can actually cause liver disease. Well, it's all a bit debated about how much significance fluke has in horses, um, but it is something that is reported and can cause problems and something that we, we can test for if we're, if we're concerned.
The fourth type, as I mentioned, was as actually an insect that can cause intestinal problems and, and that's bots um, and these are bots in the stomach of a horse in this picture here um, and fly larvae um, flies are kind of involved in the intermediate height cycle of, the, of these ones um, they can do some mild damage to the mouth um, and actually if we do see them in some numbers sometimes in the stomach but actually if you remove them we don't see any problems underneath underneath so for most horses bots don't cause many problems um, and they often have a, a life cycle that's kind of around a year basically um, but it's something that sometimes I pick up when I'm gastroscoping horses. So just to move quickly kind of through the ectoparasites so we're moving to the outside of the horse now and I'm sure I guess we all might be more aware of the ectoparasites that affect our horses because we can see them more easily than we can the internal parasites so um, insects have a slightly different life cycle and um, they have eggs or larvae um, and they can have a kind of three or more larval or, or nymphal which is another juvenile young stage of, of their development um, species include obviously the, the flies and the lice. So flies, the bane of everyone's life, I think. Um, there's huge amounts of different species um, and, and obviously actually flies does include mosquitoes and midges. They mainly cause discomfort, skin damage, um, pruritus and dermatitis. Um, but obviously I've mentioned a few of them can obviously transmit the other parasites we see in the horses as well. And I think obviously the, the, one of the diseases that we see quite commonly is sweet itch, which is a, called insect uh, bite hypersensitivity. I thought I'd just quickly mention about sweet itch control because I think it's something that such a common problem um, for our patients and then um, it's the kind of right time of year for it to all start developing um, and some important things to think about is obviously to try and control um, anything before the mid-season really gets going ideally not waiting for your horse to become itchy before you're acting we advise that horses are obviously stable during dawn and dusk when midge activity is greatest. Um, that can be pretty challenging, depending on what time dawn and dusk are and when you're trying to bring your horses in and, and avoid, or if you want to try and turn out at night, obviously that does mean if you, you have to be pretty nocturnal to bring them in before the midges get going. Turning out horses in fields with kind of lower midge burdens, wind is good for these, for avoiding that. So breezy pastures, if you've got higher ground and anything away from woodland um, and also away from any kind of um, standing water um, ponds or lakes because um, they really do attract the midges. Using an effective fly rug and for most horses that, that are affected by this, this does really include including the whole neck, the, the face and there are quite a few rugs that now really cover the whole of the, of the belly as well and that can make a really big big difference by stopping the midges getting access. Um, and obviously using a, a kind of effective long acting product which contains permethrin um, and citronello um, can help to kill and repel the flies. And there's something that we've started to think about in the last few years is, is use of a vaccine called Insole. And Insole is a vaccine that's actually designed for ringworm, which is a fungi. Um, but there seems to be some evidence that that can help um, switch off the kind of hypersensitivity that the skin might be having to these midges in their, their, um, in their saliva. And it's given um, one injection um, two weeks, one injection, two, two injections, two weeks apart. And you need to really give it before the, the mid season starts. So in the kind of January, February, um, maybe March um, area of the year to try and boost um, that kind of um, vaccination response and you give it yearly. So um, that is something that you maybe want to think about or consider. So moving on, can I just talk about lice, um, creepy crawlies that we can actually see with our eyes. Um, there are two types that affect horses. Um, so Hematopinus atheni, which is a sucking one, and that's the one at the top of the pictures there, and Damalina equi, which is the biting one. Important things to know about lice is that they can really can survive off the horses for a few days. So they can live in your rugs, your brushes, your bedding. So when you're if you have lice, if the horse has lice or you're thinking you need to treat for lice, it does involve really treating everything that you have involved with your horse. So any tap, grooming equipment, rugs, um, disinfecting, all those sort of things. Um, and ideally, you would also treat all the horses that are in contact with the horse that you think has maybe got a problem because the other horses may be also having harboring their, their, the creepy crawly friends and then they can just reinfect, um, reinfect the other horse as well.
Um, arachnida, um, so these guys have a life cycle of eggs, larvae, nymph, and then an adult. So they only have one larval stage. So it's just a little bit different to the others. And these are mainly ticks and mites. So ticks, again, something that makes me feel a bit creepy. Um, often seen on kind of rough grazing or moorland, there are huge numbers of ticks um, that are present in, in the UK and around the world. And I think that pretty much most of them can infect any species they like, basically. Um, it's usually the adult tick that feeds on horses. So it's not any of the kind of lymph or, um, lymphal or larval stages. And they have quite a long life cycle. So three years for them to become an adult. Um, so they kind of harbor out in the environment quite successfully. Mainly, they just cause a local skin reaction. However, if you were really heavily infested or and you were maybe feeling poorly for another reason, it could they can cause anemia. And they can carry the parasite Borrelia burgdorferi, which can cause Lyme disease, um, which is something that is pretty rare, um, but can, um, can cause um, some problems in horses. The best way really to treat these is manual removal. And I've just put the picture of the little... Um, handy tool that you can buy on the internet for like three quid or something that is very successful at safely removing ticks so the important part is that we don't need the mouth part in the skin because that can carry on causing problems um, and reaction um, with the horses but they're they're really easy to get hold of and very easy to use so if you are um, having ticks on your horses or seeing ticks then this is something to, to do and basically the best thing is just to when you're grooming them if you see a tick remove it um, as soon as possible really Mites, um, we do see, and we see some more common than others. The burrowing ones are not too common in horses, um, but they can cause um, some problems. And we probably see more of the, the non-burrowing types, so the Coreoptes equi or the harvest mites, especially in our feathered um, cobs and, and friends like that, especially in the feathered regions that can definitely cause them irritation and the classic stomping. Often you see them to be itching. They can have alopecia, um, scabs, and um, mange, which is called by, caused by the burrowing type, as I said, is pretty uncommon, but it is possible. Um, and there is a risk that obviously you, you um, might be affected by that type as well. In lots of cases, we would um, treat this with um, injection of uh, Dectamax, which is a Doramectin product. Um, and this is actually a cattle product. So we do use it off license, but it can be very successfully um, given to horses. And um, we do that quite commonly. And that can really help um, with many of these cases where they're having, having issues. I just, um, I'm just moving on, slightly diverting because um, I just wanted to mention about foals. Um, the guys are other guys are going to talk about adult horses, but um, foals is something, and worm bands in foals is something that we worry about quite a lot um, and can actually be fatal um, in young stock. So we really advise that mares should obviously be tested, and Emily's going to discuss, discuss all of that. Um, and then they should either be wormed about three to four weeks prior to foaling, and that's to really remove their burden so that the risk of them passing on worms. Um, or any of the parasites to their to their foal is reduced. Foals should really be kept on clean pasture, um, not horse, not ones that have been contaminated um, by other adult stock or, or horses that maybe haven't had a good worming treatment or burden. Um, and generally, it's pretty safe to give foals about six to eight weeks old a dose of fenbendazole, uh, so that's panicure, um, to treat them. And then really guiding treatment further on every four weeks with a fecal egg count until they're weaned and then every three to four months until they're 18 months. Um, dependent on the age when they're reaching the right time of year to be treated for the insistent redworm, um, that is something that we would definitely recommend. You cannot use a Quest, which is the moxidexin product, um, in anything under four months of age. And you shouldn't use um, Equest Pramox, which is a moxidexin parazoconto in anything less than 6.5, six and a half months of age. So if you have foals and you're worried about what you should do with worming, obviously best to obviously chat to, to your vet um, and we can obviously get something in place um, and, and advise you on that. But it's definitely something that in young stock, they're very much more susceptible to seeing the diseases I've described. So you do need to be more careful about making sure that you're up to date with your testing and your, and your treating as appropriate. So hopefully we've covered the, the, the things I discussed at the beginning. Um, so obviously the different types of parasites that affect horses, their life cycle and the different diseases they can cause. Um, a few take home messages. Obviously, um, I hopefully have described quite a large variety of parasites that can affect horses both internally and externally. 
by understanding the life cycle and obviously those intermediate hosts and you know the flies or the um, mites um, we can helpfully try and control um, some of these cases. Disease can obviously vary from being very mild and not causing too many problems to being life-threatening and but we know that good parasite control really does reduce the risk of the major illnesses dramatically and to remember that younger horses are definitely more susceptible and we need to be pretty careful about our foals when we're dealing with them. So I think Ed's going okay. to ask me a few questions now. <laughs> Thanks, Natasha. That was a, a brilliant overview of all the parasites that horses can suffer from. I, I must admit, I didn't realise it was going to be quite so perilous to be a horse living in the UK. I thought we were, we were quite lucky with the the bugs that we had in this country, but I'd, I'd forgotten quite how many there were. That was a good good refresher from my university days. Um, why do you think we've had, I mean, we, we've certainly experienced a lot of uh, horses uh, this winter, young ones in particular. Why do you think it's been quite so bad this year for um, problems with intestinal parasites in particular? Yeah, I think Ed's obviously leading. We've, we've seen quite a lot of small red worm cases and cases that unfortunately have made it into hospital and been very poorly. And um, I think in some of the cases, we, we know that the worming maybe wasn't up to scratch and um, that they hadn't been treated as appropriately or been tested appropriately in, in the right time of year. And I think that is, is very important. Um, and then for some that we worry that actually they have been treated appropriately or tested appropriately and maybe that we're actually dealing with resistant problems in the worm as we're using, especially in, in the young stock. Um, obviously, I think climate change, we can probably blame for a lot of things. There's definitely a change in our climate and uh, maybe we're having warmer winters um, or there's a delay. I mean, we had snow <laughs> this week and, and it's April. So I think things are changing a bit on that front. Um, and maybe that we're going to have to adapt how we um, are looking at these things um, in the future. but. I think there's a plenty of combination of factors um, there. Um, I've got a couple of other uh, quick questions. Um, on Caserca, um, is, there, is there a time of year that you see that? I mean, I, I, I'm not convinced I've ever seen a case of that. Um, one, of the, one of my other questions, I suppose, would be, um, you often see things that I've often wondered might be on Caserca, which I think probably turn out to be staphylococcus infections in the skin. And I, I'm guessing that the way to differentiate them is that the staphylococcus infection is possibly more painful to palpate and things like that. Yeah, I think often, I think Zonkara is very, very rare. I put it in for completeness. Um, I think sometimes I think it's biopsy of the skin or of a lesion that could be suspicious. Um, and the identification of the parasite in 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 the in the lesion, um, yes, I think that staphylococcal infections tend to be exquisitely uncomfortable when you try and touch them. Um, and whereas if you've got a localized kind of oncara lesion, then it's less so. But as I said, it's pretty pretty rare in the UK. And then on another weird one, the habronema, those uh, summer uh, summer sores that you were showing the image of yeah. uh, on the the lip. I mean, I've, I've often seen horses with uh, sores more round actually on the, the surface of the lip, um, often in fields that are, um, they've got an awful lot of buttercups. And I've, I don't know whether that, that is a, a myth or a true thing, the, the fact that the buttercups can blister them or whether or not I've been misdiagnosing them and they, they should have been diagnosed as habronema. Is, am I wrong or right? Or... <laughs> Um, I think but can cause a skin sensitivity. Um, so it's possible that that's what you were seeing there. Um, I have seen habronema in the UK um, in horses. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I guess it, proving one way or another is, is more difficult, but probably treating um, habronema is very responsive to ivermectin. And sometimes we also use it topically, um, potentially with a, with a steroid as well, because the summer sores can be quite challenging to get to resolve. Um, they can kind of become a little bit chronic and some horses actually will see lesions on multiple seasons and whether that's because we haven't quite got everything under control for them or whether they're very susceptible to it is, is another possibility but and um, we definitely do see some habronema in the uk okay that's great thank you just moving on to foals again um yeah. we you talked about using uh, fenbendazole for, uh, for treating worms and you also talked about ascarids as being a 
a fairly prominent worm in in foals. Yeah. Um, what what is your experience of using fenbendazole for ascaris? Um, and over the years, we've advised that people use a double dose of uh, pyrantel product um, because we've experienced some places having resistance to other worms as far as ascarids concerned. Do you, do you think that's uh, yeah. viable? I think, it, I think it is. So we definitely do see resistance to ascarids and I think that's becoming more of a problem. Um, it's, I think most yards with fenbendazole there is resistance to a lot of the parasites. I think if you are a yard that you know that you have fenbendazole resistance and to know that it would be looking at treating with fenbendazole and then doing the fecal egg count reduction and if you're not getting that fecal egg count reduction then you think that you then it's possible the yard has fenbendazole resistance and so then yes using another another wormer that's appropriate and, and yet parental at double dose would be considered an appropriate wormer for that definitely so it highlights maybe why it's so important to do the even in foals to do the fecal egg counts to know because ascarids are very easily picked up in foal feces and you know if you've got a big burden of, of ascarids and you then treat the foal you should be able to do a fecal egg count reduction on the ascarid eggs as well and um, which would help guide because um as everyone else is in the talk is going to allude to, we, we're running out of, there's no other wormers available. So we are going to have to be careful about which ones they're using. So yeah, that's the definite. Okay, well, I think that's brilliant. You've answered some brilliant questions there. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, move on. I think 